really is a blessing to see you know, so many kids up here. And one of the things that's become very apparent to me is it's important, especially in a church like Shepherd Lakes, a church not only the size, but with so many families and young children, how important intergenerational interactions is. Because people of different ages have different stories to share. And those stories can have an impact. Have you ever thought of your own life that way? Have you thought of your life as a story before? I mean, consider this. Each of us, as we come here today, you know, before you, as you sit in that, in that pew, all of you are bringing your own unique story to this room. Take a second to think about your own past. What kind of experiences have you had in your life? Think of the joyful experiences. Think of the trials you've experienced. Get those, get those experiences in your head. Just get them there. I'm willing to bet that there are a lot of people in this room that have not had those experiences, or at least not a combination of those experiences. And even, even then, if they've had something like it, it's not exactly like you've had it. So all of our pasts are very different. And think about yourself sitting there right now. Think about what led to you being where you are. What are the events of the past that have led to the present? Because you see, in many ways, we're kind of writing our stories right now. It's ongoing. And maybe as you're sitting there, maybe you're already even thinking about what's going to come next. Maybe some of you are tempted to write down your to-do lists or whatever else you have going on tomorrow or later in the week. At the very least, I'm guessing a lot of us have an idea of where we'd like our story to end up. We've, in our own minds, kind of written the end. And so in the present, our decisions and the different things that we do in life, are, we're hoping will lead to that end. Here's my point. When we look at one another sitting in this room, we can't, I cannot look at any one of you people and, and any one of you sitting there in that pew and say, I know them based on what, what you're wearing based on who you're sitting next to, or even like if you have kids sitting next to you, because I know that your story is more complicated than just what you're presenting this morning. It would be like me opening up a novel saying, this is a great book, check out chapter five, the middle sentence in that, on that page. You know, what is that gonna tell anybody about the book? It's only a little piece. And so what I'm saying is that to understand our lives, it's good to see our lives in context of the bigger story. And this, is what I'm hoping to help you with when talking about Joseph. You saw that video, this the trailer, <laughs> kind of a little while ago. And this character of Joseph, I recognize that, that some of you here today might have a very strong understanding of who Joseph was in the Bible, and some maybe not as much. But the point is this. We had a very short reading about Joseph's life, and I don't think that we will understand what God is saying to us through Joseph today unless I put Joseph's life in context. Okay, so what we're going to do, just like I said, with each and every one of us, we could tell a story. I'm going to help you see Joseph's life from a bigger picture perspective. And through that, I hope that you'll gain a deeper understanding of what God has to say to us here today. So, to understand Joseph, you've got to take a bigger picture perspective. And you even got to go farther back beyond Joseph's life itself. And if you've been here the last couple weeks in worship, you might have heard us talk about some of these topics. But it, it, to understand Joseph, you've got to start right at the beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1. And this is what you find. This is important. Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 are important because it, it starts setting, setting up the rest of the story. God designed the world. He created order in the world. So he created everything we see and he created us. And God created human beings, first and foremost, to have a relationship with him. God was to be at the center. So here's the idea. God was at the center. He created this order, and then me having a relationship with him would then flow out into my relationships with other people. So how do I see myself? I look at God, and I see how he relates to me. And then how do I relate to the people around me? Well, I'm called to love them, care for them. How do I relate for, to creation itself? I'm called to love for, love and care for creation itself. It all flows from a relationship with God. That's the order. But then you get to Genesis chapter 3, the fall. We rejected a relationship with God. God, I don't need you, really. 
And why would that be tempting? That's what sin is. Sin is a disease that turns us inward. Who becomes most important when sin is at work in my life? Who? Me. So you see what happened in Genesis chapter 3, what happened when, when humanity rejected God is what we did was we pushed God out. And we said, who's in the middle? Me. So then how I look at myself is kind of built on my own way of projecting myself, imaging myself. How do I relate to other people? How do I relate to the world around me? Well, it all exists to serve me. See, that's, that's the default. And so God created this world. It fell, and that could have been the end of the story. Stop right there. Okay? But that's not what happened. You read further in the Bible. And God, the creator of the world, came to his broken creatures, specific creature, Abraham, and he made a promise. He said, I will use your family to bless the world. Abraham, through you, through your family, all the people of the world are going to be blessed. And this is what he did. He said, Abraham, I want you to come out here. Come outside. Look at those stars. See all those stars? See all those stars in the sky? That's how many children you're going to have. And Abraham's like an old man at this point. His wife has never had, couldn't have any children. And he's like, huh, <laughs> okay. But guess what? God is faithful to his promises. He said, Abraham, the world will be blessed through your family. You will have a child. And guess what happened? God kept his promise. Abraham had a child. And his name was Isaac, which means laughter. Can you see the irony? But Abraham, so God came to Abraham, said, through all the people of the world, you, you, will be, you will bless all the people of the world through your family. So then Abraham had his child, Isaac. Isaac had a son whose name was Jacob. Jacob later had an encounter with God, and he also became known as Israel. So Jacob, also known as Israel, then had 12 sons of his own. Big family. <laughs> so can you see God at work here? Guess who one of those sons was? Joseph. Now here's the thing. To understand the story of Joseph, you have to understand, first off, how Jacob treated Joseph. Joseph was his favorite. Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. And it wasn't one of those things. He wasn't even the oldest. And it wasn't like, you know, little things here and there. Jacob flat out didn't, you know, he just flat out bought Joseph this fancy coat of many colors and gave it to him and he wore it around everywhere. Now in those days, a coat of many colors with different dyes in the fabric, that's expensive. Imagine the 11 other brothers walking around, seeing Joseph every single day, walking around with this expensive coat that their daddy got for him, but not them. Anybody in large families here? You can only imagine what this caused. And he was a teenager. Joseph was probably around 17 years old at the time, walking around like, what? You know, you might not have even know. We don't know how much he, he was aware of their anger, but Joseph started to have some dreams. And, not thinking anything of it, he shared it with his brothers and with his father. Basically, this is what the dreams meant. The dreams, the dreams foretold that one day his brothers and his father and mother would all bow down to him. Well, he just really knows how to stir the pot, doesn't he? <laughs> so his brothers get mad. And one day, Jacob sends Joseph out to the field to get his, his brothers, many of them were older. Remember, he was just a teenager, traveling long distance to get his brothers. He finally catches up with him, and, and you, can, you can see Joseph from a distance, that nice, fancy coat. And the brothers started conspiring. Let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. Thankfully, one of the brothers, Reuben, the oldest, had a guilty conscience, and he said, no, 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 no. Let's, let's throw him in this empty well, and then we'll figure things out. So what they did was they grabbed Joseph, took his coat away from him, threw him in this well, and what ends up happening is he ends up getting sold to traders who are passing by on their way to Egypt for some money. <laughs> they give them, they, 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 sell, they sell their own brother for some money, okay? And then what do they do is they go kill an animal, they wipe the blood all over Joseph's coat, and what do they do? They take it back to their dad and they say he's dead. So here's teenage Joseph in shackles heading off to Egypt, brothers with their father, father mourning the death of his favorite son. Well, Joseph is, is taken to Egypt. He becomes 
a, a servant for a man named Potiphar. He's purchased by a man named Potiphar, okay? And while he's working in Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph. And what does Joseph say? No, this isn't right. And so what does she do? She goes to her husband and says, he tried to seduce me. And if you're in Potiphar's position, what would you do? He gets sent to prison. So Joseph ends up getting sold into slavery, not really because of any of his own doing. He ends up rotting in prison because he made the right choice. And here he is, just sitting there. This is like 15 years later. He's in his 30s. This is, what's, this is his life. Imagine that. Put that in perspective. Imagine yourself in Joseph's, in Joseph's position. While Joseph's in prison, he runs into a man, so we can track here, thrown into prison while in Egypt. He runs into a cupbearer. He was a, basically the butler for the, for, the, for the pharaoh. He comes to Joseph and he starts telling him about these dreams he's been having. And God gave Joseph the ability to discern dreams. So Joseph says, you know what your dream means? In three days, Pharaoh's going to remember you. He's going to restore you to, to your position, okay? But I want you to remember me. Don't forget me. <laughs> well, in three days, what happened? The, the Pharaoh remembered the butler. He ends up working for the Pharaoh again. What happened? He forgot Joseph. <laughs> Two years. Big oops. <laughs> Still in prison. Pharaoh starts to have dreams of his own. Nobody can figure out what they mean. Hmm, the cupbearer, the butler. I know somebody. His name's Joseph. So they go fetch Joseph. They have to clean him up because he's been in prison. He's pretty disgusting. And so they clean him up, bring him to the Pharaoh. And you know what Joseph says? He says, I know what your, your dreams mean, and God, God's helping me to see what these mean. Your dreams mean that for seven years you're going to have plenty. You're going to have all that you want in terms of food. You'll have grain. You'll have... Best harvest ever. But after those seven years are over, you're going to have seven years of famine. Nothing in the land. People are going to be starving. And so you need to have somebody who's got it together in charge to take care of this and manage all of this. Guess what Pharaoh says? Huh, Joseph, why don't you do it? So now Joseph is second in command in Egypt. And everything, he that, everything that was foretold took place. And what Joseph did is he starts to t t set aside all the, all the goods, all the things that were, all, the, all the, the years of plenty, all the extra crops. And then what happens is when the famine comes, they have all this food in storehouses, and they open up the doors, and the people are saved. Guess who was also starving at this time? Joseph's family. <laughs> Jacob and his brothers, they're off dying. And so what do they say? Well, I hear Egypt's got a lot of food. So his brothers end up going to Egypt, and they don't recognize, they end up, in, they end up at Joseph's feet, bow down to him, and they look at Joseph, and they don't recognize him because Joseph was a teenager, okay? This is years later, but Joseph knows them. And now, <laughs> do you understand the importance of story now? Now with Joseph staying in front of those brothers, can you understand how you might view them? And how powerful it is what Joseph does. He says, he, first he reveals himself, and then he says, I forgive you. He reconciles with his family, and he uses his power to save his family. So that's how the story ends. Reunited with, forgives his brothers. And the question you probably want to ask yourself here is this. Who is the main character of this story? Here's the gut reaction. The main character is Joseph. The main point of the story is I should forgive. And how does God fit into all of that? Well, if I have enough faith, things will work out the way I'm hoping they will. God's kind of periphery. Do you see how we do that kind of in our own lives? Who's, we have stories here. Who's the main character in my story? Hmm? Me. What is the point of life? Make the right decisions. And how does God fit into all this? Well, I just got to kind of have faith and hopefully God will, things will work out the way I want. Is that how things work? <laughs> well, here's the deal. If you see Joseph's life in a broader perspective, it all starts to make sense. Do you remember J J Joseph's great-grandfather? Abraham. What did God say to Abraham? He made a promise. And he said, through you, all the people of the world will be 
blessed, right? That meant that through his family, God would bless everybody. And, and so Joseph's here, he's this guy that got, he got the worst of the worst situation. His own family betrayed him. He ends up in prison. And here, here, now he finds himself standing in front of his brothers with the power to, to execute them if he wants to. But could you imagine, perhaps in Joseph's position, he stood there and he thought, wow, they're sorry. And God's promises are real. This is what God had in mind the whole time. Even this, this evil that my brother's intended for me, he's working it for good because you see, I have the power. God is using me to be able to save my family and that promise will continue. This is what Joseph said to his own brothers. He said, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. What is the great good that God worked through Joseph? Was it just his family being saved? Yes, that was a good thing. But we're, seeing the, we're only seeing a tiny picture here. You see, it's through Joseph's family that one day a baby would be born in a small town called Bethlehem. It's through his family that that promise to Abraham would come to fulfillment as Jesus himself was born. And truly, in many ways, Joseph points us to, to Jesus who is everything, even more than Joseph ever could have been. Do you understand that, that Jesus and Joseph have a lot of parallels? Jesus was beloved by his father. He was rejected by the very people he came to save, by his own people. He was sold for money. And through the evil that was intended towards Jesus, what did he do? He blessed all of us. All of us, through Jesus, we are given a new promise. And every time you look to the cross, you can be reminded of that promise. Joseph said, he said, I forgive you to his brothers. And he did things for them. And, but what did Jesus do for you and for me? He gave his life. He gave it all. He suffered and died on a cross. And because of that, you can know that God looks at you and he says, I promise you, if you come to me, you drop, you, you lay your sins at my feet, I will say, I forgive you because of Jesus. And when you look to that cross right now, you can see it's empty because Jesus didn't stay on that cross. He rose again. And so the promise of forgiveness is tied with another promise, eternal life. Brothers and sisters, as we live our lives trying to create our own ending, saying this is how it's going to end. This is, this is the way I want it to be. And I'm going to make all my decisions to get to this end. What God says to you is, I promise you, the ending that I have in mind for you is so much better than the one you have in your own head. It is. That's the message. And you see, what happens here is God calls you and me to live our own lives in the context of his promise to us. To understand one another, to truly know one another and love one another, we need to know one another's stories, right? But we also need to understand that our stories are lived in the context of a much greater story and a greater God than I could ever be on my own. I'm a pretty horrible God when I take control of my own life. I can tell you, there are many times I've, I've come across people who have said, you know, Pastor, I just don't understand why, you know, I'm, 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 I can't, I have a hard time forgiving this person because they've just done so many horrible things to me or this circumstance, I mean, it's so difficult and I just have a hard time seeing God in all of this. And, and, and always my, my answer is, how do you see God? Do you hear the promise that he's made to you? Do you see the cross? Do you hear the words, forgiven? Do you hear the promise of eternal life? Because it is through Jesus that I am strengthened, that we are strengthened to face whatever the world may throw at us. I used to live in St. Louis, and there's an entryway. Um, there's a couple entrances, but one of the entryways to the St. Louis Zoo um, that I used to take my kids to quite a bit. Actually, as a kid, I used to go there as well. If you go there today, you'll find that there is a bridge that leads from one of the parking lots to the zoo itself. That bridge tells a story. During my time in St. Louis, I worked at a church, and during my time there, this story, it ha this happened, there's this, this story that I'm talking about occurred in 2001. It happened well before I was there, but 
it's a story that resonated through that congregation for a long time. Much like Shepherd Lakes, the church I was at had a school. And much like school here at Shepherd Lakes or whatever other school you, the kids, you kid, your kids go to, um, they go on field trips. And so they decided the first grade class would go on a field trip. And just like I went on a field trip with my kids this past week, actually, you know, and so it kind of resonated with me this week as I was thinking about this. But first grade went. Teacher took the kids. A bunch of chaperones went as normal. The parents drove. They went to the zoo. Everybody goes to the zoo, okay? All the, a lot of schools go to the zoo. They had a great time. At the very end, what do you think they did? Well, they got by the sign. They took a class picture, right? And then it was off to the cars and back to school, back home. On the uh, short walk to the parking lot, one of the kids got close to the curb, and one of the uh, and there was a, a man who was drinking and driving, jumped the curb, hit the child head on, six year old. His mother was there, it happened right in front of her, the entire class, every single chaperone, and the teacher. They did CPR, they did everything, but a six year old died in his mother's arms, right there at the entryway to the zoo, as chaperones are trying to carry people out get them back, get the kids back to the car, trying to care for the family. As you can imagine, this resonated through the entire school, through the entire church. How do you think that mother was able to get through that? What do you think her answer was? She was able to get through it because of God's promise to her. She was able to sit in her church home at a funeral for her six-year-old boy because she knew that God promised her son eternal life and she would see him again. She was able to face that drunk driver face to face and offer forgiveness. Not because it was something she wanted to do, but because she knew that she had a God that had forgiven her. And to this day, 15, we're almost 15 years later, every single year, she goes to the parole hearing for that driver. He hasn't shown a lot of remorse. And so every single year, she appeals that he needs to spend another year and learn his lesson. She faces him. And she continues to advocate, ad, be an advocate for making smart choices when we get in our cars and making smart choices with things like alcohol. How is she able to do that? You see, just like Joseph, she found herself in the midst of a situation where she could look at this and say, this is what God's been preparing me for. This is why he gave me the promise. And the same is true for all of you. Why do we come here today? Why do we gather for worship on Sundays? Why do we encourage you to get into the word? Why do I say things like it's important to point our children to Jesus? Because that is what the promise is for. When that moment comes, when you say, this, this, is why I have needed Jesus all along. Because the story at the end of the day it's not all about me. It's about him. That is the type of congregation we are. Gathering around Christ. Gathering around him. The one who points us to the promise. To the hope that will never fail us. May we never forget that for Jesus' sake. Amen.